Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Awkward moment, but I'm going to open this. I'm going to stare you down while I do it. How are you all? No. I'm a man of faith, Nathan, but my accuracy may be off. Okay, before we get started today, we have been singing about the name of Jesus, and I feel impressed upon my spirit. Before we get going into the word that we need to do something, we need to take authority in the name of Jesus over something, and that is your ears. That is your ears. We're going to be preaching from the word of God today, and I want your ears to be open. So I want you to put your own hands on your ears all across this auditorium this morning. This is not a weird thing. I want you to close your eyes. In Jesus' name, I pray for every ear to be open, every ear to hear the word of God and be changed in Jesus' name. Any blockage that is there be gone, any blockage over the mind, any blockage over the heart. And I pray that this seed that goes forth this morning falls in good ground in Jesus' name. Are you ready to hear the word? Now listen to this. This is Psalm 1914, and this is going to be the prayer this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. And before I get into anything else, we just came back from our state conference this week, which was an awesome time, a great time as a team together, a great time of gathering and being under the word. And because it wouldn't be acknowledged any other way, I want to acknowledge our senior pastors who took us up there, who put us up and put us in a position to receive. And I want to say thank you for doing that. And thank you for being the kind of leaders that do that for us. And another thing is that Pastor Lou is, has been elected to another term on the state executive. So you as a church, you should know this because you need to get behind her and you need to get behind Felix and you need to pray for this family. They're on the front lines. This is tip of the spear kind of stuff. So pray for them. Okay. We're going to be reading from Romans chapter 10 this morning. If you have an old school Bible with you, does anyone actually have a physical Bible? That is so cool. Yes. Yes. This is fantastic. Yes, Josh Brown over in the corner, but you can read behind me here, but we are going to go through Romans 10, starting from verse 8, and this is the New International Version. Verse 8, it says, but what does it say? The word is near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you, you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, listening from verse 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want to talk to you briefly this morning about this word, Caruso. And I want you to have a go at saying that. Caruso. Caruso. Say with some gusto. Caruso. Caruso. From the diaphragm. Caruso. Caruso. It's an important word that you actually need to have a bit of gusto behind because Vine's Dictionary describes this word as to proclaim, to herald, to be a herald, and more specifically, to be a herald of the gospel. Verse 14 of Romans 10. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The Greek word for preaching here is this word I just shared with you, caruso. It's used 61 times in 60 different verses in the New Testament. 
Matthew 3, 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching Caruso in the wilderness of Judea. Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach Caruso and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 10, 27, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach Caruso on the housetops. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach Caruso, the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 20, and they went out and preached Caruso everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. And to finish that, Luke 4, 18 to 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach Caruso, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim Caruso, liberty to the captives and recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim. There it is again, Caruso, the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I put to you this morning that this word Caruso, to herald, to proclaim, to declare, is at the core of what it is to be the New Testament church. And it's at the core of what it is to be a New Testament Christian. I dare say that every Bible-believing Christian here today that is born again agrees that the message of salvation in Jesus Christ is good news. But I would equally say The passion for the Caruso, the passion for the proclamation, the passion for the declaration, the passion for the heralding of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not where it should be in our lives. It's been said many times from this platform that you cannot outsource your faith. Can I get specific with this this morning? And this may ruffle a few feathers Wait a minute, I'm in a feather ruffling mood this morning. You cannot outsource your Caruso. You cannot outsource your personal declaration. You cannot outsource your personal proclamation. You cannot outsource your personal heralding of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Even though you have a personal confession of Christ, and you do have a personal confession of Christ, it is not meant to be private. Matthew 10, 32 to 33, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, this is Jesus speaking, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven, but everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before the Father in heaven. Heavy words from Jesus. And this denial is not just in words, but it's the way that we live, the choices that we make, the behaviors that we display, because you could say you love God, you can say that you are a Christian, but if that is not backed up by how you live, well, there's another Greek word for that too. Hypocrite. And if there was one thing that Jesus thundered out about the most in the New Testament, it was hypocrisy. There's another reason why it's so important for you to have your personal Caruso, and that is this simple reason. I'm not you, and you are not me. Okay, I'm up here, I have the privilege of preaching, I have a microphone in my hand, and I have a message to present, but the one thing I can never have is your message, your witness. I can never give your personal Caruso, your declaration of how Jesus came into your life, and how you had the revelation of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, your personal proclamation of his saving grace and unending mercy, your personal heralding of the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. I have my story, but you have yours. And we both, as Bible-believing, born-again, spirit-filled Christians, have the solemn, sanctified, holy duty to share our Caruso with the world. Because as the word says, how will they know to call upon the name of the Lord unless you proclaim and declare and herald and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? And let me personalize this for one moment. How will your family, 
How will your friends come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ unless you share him with them? How will they know what he's done in your life unless you share that with them? Each of us have different families, different friends, different colleagues, different spheres of impact and influence. So each of us need to be sharing our personal caruso in all of these different areas. Even when it comes to our social media. Just as an example, most of us here have some sort of social media. Am I correct in saying that? Who is on some sort of social media platform? Hands up, hands up. Quite a few. This social media platform or platforms is called a platform because you, it gives you the platform to present yourself to the world. But most of the time, this platform is used in this way. Hey, well, this is me and the eggs Benedict I just had for brunch. Hey, world, this is me and the new sunglasses I just got. Hey, world, this is me at the beach or the park or the footy. Hey, world, this is me and my crazy dog. Hey, world, this is me on my soapbox of opinion. Saying something about the latest social event or political situation. What would it look like if we changed our social media platform that was erected and created to co comment and proclaim on you and change it around and give our caruso and proclamation of Jesus Christ? What if we filled the airwaves and saturated social media with picture after picture, post after post, comment after comment, proclaiming, declaring, preaching, and heralding the gospel of Jesus Christ? What would it look like if your social media platforms were a stage for your Caruso, a platform to herald the King, to proclaim the year of the Lord? What if we were all like the Samaritan woman we see in John chapter 4? Who took her encounter with Jesus Christ and went straight back to where she was from and where she was known and became an arrow that pointed people to Jesus. And we're going to go through this story at the moment. It's very quiet after I talked about social media. But I dare say I have a point. John chapter 4, starting from verse 7, it says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you were speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Verse 11, but sir, you don't have a rope or bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals have enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. Verse 16, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Verse 17, ooh, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it with you Jews that you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming indeed, it is here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
The Father is looking for those who will worship him this way, for God is a spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. For the sake of time, I'm going to jump down to verse 39. It says, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear this message and believe. And you know what happened after this? Because this woman shared her caruso, because she declared and proclaimed and heralded Jesus, many others that were away from Jesus were drawn near to him. And now they have their own caruso. Verse 42 Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the saviour of the world. Can you understand the gravity of that sentence? Because of this one woman and her Caruso, a whole village that was segregated and disregarded by the Jews has an encounter with the king of the Jews, the king of kings, the savior king, and many are saved. And we can't disregard the significance and the demography of this woman. Have a look at verse 27 again. Then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Oh man, could you imagine this scene? These prudish Jewish disciples caught up in their zealous Judaism. See Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And their jaws hit the ground so fast with such velocity that it creates a localized dust storm. (gasps) What is he doing talking to a Samaritan woman? They were shocked. She's not like us. She's not one of us. She's different. Church, in this, I have a warning for you. Don't be like these disciples. When you see believers with the courage to reach out to those who are outside the comfort zone or the normal, don't be a negative detractor. Don't be the kind of Christian that looks at the situation and whispers, why are they talking to them? They look a little weird. They're dressed inappropriately. Their tattoos are so extreme. Or even worse would be, I can't believe he's talking to them. I know what they're like and what they've done. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid we forget this. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We are all infected with the same disease of sin. And we can all only be saved by one thing, the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank God this Samaritan woman was not affected by the disciples. Rather, she runs back to her village with amazement and excited and excitement because of her encounter with Jesus and in spite of the reaction of the disciples. This is an extraordinary thing in and of itself because I'd say it wouldn't have been an easy life for this woman. I would say this woman in her village had a bit of a reputation. The whispers and the downcast comments. This is the one that's been divorced five times. She's so dysfunctional. She just cuts and runs. I hope this guy that she's with now knows what he's in for. This woman just can't commit to a relationship. It doesn't matter how you slice the pie. This much relational baggage will cause pain. And we'd be looking at years of relational instability. She's quite likely had serious deep issues that need to be worked through because she seems to be in a very 
destructive pattern of behavior. You may think that you have setbacks and barriers in your life that prevent you from sharing your caruso. But this woman had her proverbial back against the wall when it came to her being a reliable and integral witness. She was a woman in the day and the time where women were disregarded. She was a Samaritan, a people that were shunned by the Jews. She was a divorcee multiple times over and was currently living in a de facto relationship. But instead of being, this being a prevention, it became a platform for her to share about what Jesus has done in her life. And I guarantee you, this woman did not have it all together before she started sharing Jesus with others. She didn't have time to. She ran back to the village, left her water behind. The very reason she was at the well, she left there and just ran back. And she starts sharing with people about Jesus. And now get this, before she had dealt with her de facto relationship. Because sanctification comes after salvation. She had her encounter with the Saviour. Her heart is believing. Her mouth is witnessing. And her feet are bringing the good news. And her discipleship is continuing. Worship team, can you join me up here now, please? Now, I've got a few questions. Senior saints. Do we have senior saints within this house this morning? I can see some. They just lost their voice. Senior saints, if you, are, if, if you are 70 and above, give me a shout out. That wasn't a shout out. Give me a shout out. Emma, you are not 70 and above. Okay, that's good. Okay. So senior saints, mature Christians. Here's a mature Christian here. I have a question for you. Has your discipleship and learning ceased? That's not a rhetorical question. Shout me down. Has your discipleship and learning ceased? No. Okay, good. Are you still being grown from glory to glory? Yes. Are you still being sanctified by truth? Good. So am I. I'm not up here preaching because I have it all together, because I guarantee you I do not. I'm up here because Jesus Christ has given me a reason to have a caruso. He has given me a reason to proclaim and declare and to herald the good news. And he has appointed me and anointed me to do so. And you, Christian, you, the church of Jesus Christ, have been appointed and anointed to share your caruso in your world. Part of your job as a believer is to be like this Samaritan woman and be an arrow. And I mean that in two senses of the word. We need to be arrows that point Jesus, point to Jesus, just like this Samaritan woman. Come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. Here he is. There he is. This is him. Point, point, point. This is the Saviour. And just to remind you this morning, You are not the Saviour. Take the pressure off. Do the John Farnham and take the pressure down. You are not called, appointed or anointed to be the Saviour. That is not your job. However, you are called to be an arrow with a caruso declaring, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You point towards Him. This is who Jesus is and this is what He has done in my life. Your life becomes an arrow pointing towards the Saviour, Jesus Christ. But you are also called to be an arrow in the Lord's quiver. Note, you are the arrow, you are not the archer. We are placed in the hand of the commander and the captain of the angel armies. And in, the, in His time, in His strength, in His stretch and power, we are fired and sent into the places we are called to. Into the marketplace, into hospitals, into schools, into the mission field, overseas, over the road. Planting churches, starting connect groups, starting ministries, 
reaching the sick, connecting the isolated. You are throwing, you're being stretched and you're being fired as an arrow. Just imagine what the kingdom impact of this church would be if we were all arrows in the Lord's quiver, ready to go, ready to be fired whenever and wherever the commander of the angel armies wants us to go. Just imagine the kingdom impact this church would have if we all unleashed our Caruso and acted as the Samaritan woman who used her past and her problems as a platform to declare that the Messiah is here. Salvation is here. The way, the truth and the life is here. And what if we just took this from the realms of imagination and brought it into existence, bringing it from rhetoric on a Sunday morning where a crazy guy in a green t-shirt is yelling at you, but bring it into reality and into your week. It's already been said this morning, stir up the gift that is within you. Stir up the caruso that is within you. Stir up the proclamation. Be a herald for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the place that God has placed you. And I felt in my spirit as I was preparing that we should spend some time in praise and worship to sing our Caruso. And I believe as we do this, the Holy Spirit is going to ignite something within you. As we were praying here before, and I felt impressed on my spirit that dreams that people have had when they were younger would come back alive. Well, you weren't tainted by your life experience and the things that you could not do. And you just thought boldly about the things you could do with Christ in your life. I pray that that comes alive this morning. Boomers, I'm talking to you. Do not put your cue in the rack. You are not done. You are not done. You've got to be bold. You've got to be ready to be fired. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70. If you are an arrow in the Lord's quiver, get ready to be fired into the place where He has sent you. I believe some of you will actually hear that voice of calling this morning. I believe there's going to be a shift and there will be a special and unique courage that will come upon you as you boldly come before the throne of grace this morning and say to Almighty God and echo the words of Isaiah in the throne room saying, here I am, Lord. Send me, will you stand this morning? We're gonna be singing about Jesus. I want you to lift your hands. All across this auditorium this morning, lift your hands. You are not too cool for this. This is a powerful moment. This is a significant moment, not just within the church, but within the kingdom of God. This is not rhetoric. This is not a display. This is the power of God that is about to fall. I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to pray. Then we're gonna release this worship team to sing over us. And I want you to release your Caruso. Father God, in Jesus' Name, I pray, I pray that there is such a powerful move of God this morning in East Coast Church, that callings come alive, that fire is ignited within minds and hearts from the young to the old. I pray the fivefold ministry comes alive within this house, that churches are born out of this house this morning. Ministries are born out of this house this morning. Evangelists, prophets, preachers, teachers, all of the fivefold be born out of this place this morning in Jesus' Name. Because we are under Your grace. It is not by might, it's not by power, but by Your Spirit and the unearned, unmerited grace of God in Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, fall this morning. As hands are lifted high, as hearts are open, fill this room with Your fire as You did on Pentecost. Let us spill out into the streets in our families and see this community and country and world change with our Caruso, that Jesus Christ is here, Messiah is here, the King of Kings is here, and He is here to save the world in Jesus' Name. Thank you.